So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Pativity quarterly economic update. It's eight o'clock. Um, we'll we'll make a start. Uh, my name's Paul Middleton, and I'm joined here today by my colleagues from Pativity and our sister company, Robert Half Two. It's great to see you all here, bright and early, and especially uh, lots of familiar faces this morning. Today, we are talking about the future of our economy. And doesn't it feel like a very apt time to do that? With so many different economic headlines each day, some pointing towards economic optimism, but so many others suggesting the UK might just be juddering to a halt. What does our post-pandemic and post-Brexit future really look like? Who are the most likely winners and losers likely to be in the months or indeed years to come? Will we see a shift towards a greener economy? And how high can prices go, particularly fuel prices? Or should we just embrace the uncertainty and put, and put all of our savings in, into Bitcoin and be done with it? To lead the debate today and to answer all those questions, but more importantly, all your questions, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. John Ashcroft. As some of you may remember from his appearances on our collaboration forum, John specialises in economics, strategy and financial markets, working with professional firms, large corporates and, and SMEs. He's the author of The Saturday Economist, his weekly blog published on the website of the same name that some of you may subscribe to, discussing the UK and the world economy. And I think my team will just post a link to his, uh, his blog as I'm speaking. John specialises in viral modelling, and it's this combination of modelling and statistical fueled economics that has resonated with so many of you before. So we thought it would be great to bring him back and give you an update on his insights, perspectives and challenges and optimism. John will be presenting his thoughts using some slides. So if you have questions, I'd, I'd really ask you to write your questions in the Teams chat as we go. I'll save them up and put your hand up in Teams at the end and I'll come to you then. John will probably speak for around 40 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time after that for questions. But whatever you do, please, please get involved. Let us know your thoughts, post your questions as it's infectious. And ultimately, this is your forum and, and hopefully you get lots out of it. So, John. Great to see you again. Thank you for joining us and over to you. OK, well, thank you, Paul, and good morning to everyone as we uh, start the session this morning. As soon as you may know, I have a sort of contrarian bias and an optimism bias to my work, and that will be reflected in the presentation this morning. It's a very interesting time, isn't it? Because uh, it got to the stage with COVID where one just had to turn off the TV screens. And it was also the same with the economics news over the last couple of weeks. The best advice is to switch off the news and stop watching Newsnight and other things because it is all so incredibly gloomy. But it isn't. In fact, we're at a very fascinating, interesting uh, phase of the economy, which uh, we'll be touching on today. So without any further ado, I'm going to pull up my slide deck. <clears throat> a lot of content this morning. I'm sorry about that, but I think it's important that we look really hard behind the numbers. So bear with me as I work the miracle and pull up my slide deck. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to include the computer sound, thanks to Gary. Here come my slides. And off we go. So the slides are up. Uh, this is the uh, economics quarterly update with uh, Protivity and Robert Half. These are some of the things I've been uh, blogging about over the last couple of weeks with the Saturday Economist, that A, UK growth is much faster than expected, despite all the gloom and doom and the projections of, we are seeing a slight slowdown, but that was always to be expected after the sensational growth in the second quarter. Secondly, the clearly there are signs of UK growth, there are signs of overheating in the economy, reflected in input prices, output prices, and the CPI inflation. And we now see that with the energy crisis, saving the planet may just have to wait. How's that for a controversial thought this morning? Joe Biden's asking OPEC to pump out more oil. The Europeans are asking Putin to put in more gas. And generally, it's a question of pushing aside some of those really ESG concerns for the moment while we get through this particular energy crisis. More on that later. So the world economy, we're going to be talking about the world economy, the prospects for the UK, what's happening to prices, and what's happening to interest rates and markets. And I think to put it in context, we saw with the COVID crisis, a vast, big, enormous, incredible economic shock to the system. And now what we're experiencing is a seismic event. 
that actually there's a dislocation with the in, within the economy. Demand has surged, particularly in the West, in the America, well, China for that matter, in China and in America and in the UK. So demand has surged and the supply chain has not come yet on stream. We've seen it with a classic chip crisis and we're seeing with other commodity prices and so on. So this enormous shock to the economy has led to this real dislocation, this disruption between the supply and demand reflected in what's is reflected in what's happening to world trade, which we'll touch on. And there's also this incredible switch to a reassessment of work-life balance. Apparently, there were four and a half million resignations in the US in August. Four and a half million decided to kick out and change jobs because they just weren't happy with things as they are. And I, I know that uh, Layla has got some fascinating tales of issues and challenges in the recruitment sector. So first, we're going to have a look at what is happening to uh, world growth. And we turn to the IMF, who just updated their forecast, or amended their forecast for the year. And they've downgraded their forecast for world growth. Shocking. It's gone from 6.1 to 5.9. Nobody would really notice. But here's Gita as she talks about what she's been talking about. The global recovery continues, but the momentum has weakened, hobbled by the pandemic. Yeah. Now, feel That's right, actually, because what she was saying effectively is the global economy has seen the downturn to 5.9. Uh, percent for the uh, world as a whole and 4.9 percent in the UK in, in next year. And in the advanced economies, there's a slowdown of 5.2 percent from 4.5 and so on. Specifically at various economies, the US is the big downgrade, down from 6.5 to 6, because there's worries about supply chain problems, labour recruitment problems, and a general sense of slowdown in the economy. And that's one of the biggest markdowns. China, remarkably unchanged for the moment, still about 8 percent growth. And the UK has been downgraded. We'll talk a lot about the UK uh, over the next uh, uh, half an hour or so. But actually, I think the IMF and I think everyone else at the moment have at that. Most people have got it wrong for the UK because now with growth of 24% in the second quarter, it's almost statistically impossible for growth to be as low as many are suggesting. So uh, when we look at um, the OECD, for example, they're suggesting growth in the UK will be just 6.7% this year. Not bad anyway, but it's likely to be better than that. And in the US, they've got growth marked down at 6% and China at 8.5%, roaring away in China. Now, what we see is this pattern of, of domestic GDP. We saw the big shock to the economy in 2020 and then a marked econ uh, recovery as we go forward. So everybody's talking about the recovery which will take place. And it's the strength and duration of the economy which is important. And actually, the strength looks good and the duration looks good. And fundamentally, what is happening is this is incredible bounce back in world trade. We see expect world trade to grow by over 15% in 2021. It's actually grown by 22% in the second quarter of the year. Bearing in mind last year, container capacity was cut in Q3, demand slumped in Q2, container capacity was cut back, and a lot of these boxes are in the wrong place around the world, and now they're racking up at the docks, uh, specifically in the uh, west coast of America. And when we look at it graphically, you can see what happened. There's an incredible slump in activity in 2020, and then the bounce back, which has soared above trend levels. And it's this surging world trade that is creating the problems with cargo vessels diverted now from the UK into Europe for chopping up to be brought back into the smaller ports and the problems at Felixstowe. And that is as nothing compared to what is happening in the USA, with the ships waiting off the California coast, unable to unload their cargo. And America is talking about an ailing supply chain, an ailing supply chain because they can't get the containers into the ports fast enough and they can't get them out fast enough. And why? Part of the reason they can't get them out is because they haven't got any HGV drivers. They certainly haven't got any from Europe, but Europe is not the problem in the US, and it doesn't explain all of the problem in the UK. And what we've seen in this surge in world trade, this surge in, in uh, container traffic, this dislocation to container traffic, is a big increase in freight prices. So here we pick out the China East Asia trade to North America, where rates have gone from, say, $5,000 quadrupling to $20,000. Now, the thing is, with as with this in all prices, in farming, we say, the best cure for rising prices is rising prices. And so it will be with the elements of all the quality prices, freight prices and uh, energy prices we see around the world. 
And the US trade deficit is surging to a record level as the shortfall with China keeps rising. So much for the Trump's policy of isolation. Uh, it just is not going to work. We never thought it would. But anyway, what we've seen in world trade is incredible bounce back in world activity in world trade, creating a freight uh, shipping crisis compounded by COVID breakouts in uh, Thailand and Vietnam and in parts of China, which again impedes the loading of product into the containers anyway. Looking specifically at China, we're marking down China with an 8% growth this year. We've just seen the OECD at 8.5, but this 8.1% is pretty high and it's surging forward. And we see, we talk about, we've always talked about the return of the middle come kingdom, the strength of China as the dominant economy within the world in the years to come. The share of global exports of goods is around 15% in China compared to 8% in the USA. And we reckon it's going to overtake the USA as the largest economy in the world by 2028, and it's going to double in size by 2035. Currently the second largest economy in the world, but still struggles to get into the top 50 in terms of GDP per capita. A lot of capacity for expansion. And this is why the Chinese have been hoovering up. They've been diverting the LNG traffic, the gas traffic, even when it's mid-ocean, they've been pulling it back to the mainland China to support the levels of activity. We've already seen episodes of uh, um, outages in energy in China, and they've been nicking a lot of the LNG traffic around the world. So again, with the, it's going to be the new reserve currency at some stage, not quite yet, still domination by the dollar and the euro, with the renminbi of the yuan down about 4% of total activity for the present time. So we're seeing this incredibly strong growth in China continue. It didn't even drop last year, the strong growth in Chinese activity continue. And we also see a big bounce back in the USA, sucking in imports from around the world, especially from uh, the China and the uh, and the Eastern Bloc, yeah, the, the Far Eastern Bloc. In the US, the adults are back in the White House, unfortunately behaving like children, but not to get too involved in politics. The growth rate there, we penciled in 6.5% this year. Uh, IMF and OECD are market down to 6%. But generally, what we're seeing is this strong growth in uh, specifically, strong recovery in, in, in the world generally, strong growth in China, strong growth in the US, strong growth recovery in the UK. And this is causing this seismic event, this dislocation between supply and demand. Really, it's a very strong positive outlook. Even you know, product losses today that can't be supplied are tomorrow's de derived demand. So it, it does look incredibly supportive of strong growth. In the US, as I say, some of marked down growth to 6%, well, we'll see what happens. And the unemployment rate, it hit 13% in the second quarter. It's now down about uh, to, towards 5% uh, by the, or 6.8% by the final quarter. And it's reckoned to slow to about 4.5% um, by the end of the current year, sorry, by the end of the current year. And these incredible numbers, you know, high levels of uh, vacancies and a high level, uh, well, a reducing level of unemployment. And as I say, 4.5 million switching jobs or trying to switch jobs in August. Incredible. The inflation rate. Generally, we've seen inflation kick up. We saw the September number at 5.4%. Uh, it's generally going to be about 5.3% in the current quarter. And the expectations are, this is a scenario. This is our central benign scenario that uh, the unemployment, uh, the inflation rate will slow towards 3.5% as we move into the second half. So inflation is always and everywhere. Not a monetary phenomena anymore, but inflation is always and everywhere a transitory phenomena, something we won't have to worry about over over the as the six months go by. Same twin deficit dilemma problems for your students of, um, of economics that the deficit this year will be about three trillion dollars. So much for hopes of tapering. The Fed talking about tapering in November. Tapering cannot begin until the debt levels fall within the lending capacity of the private sector. So the central banks have still got a lot to do to support government borrowing. And we know the trade deficit is going to continue to increase. And also the level of borrowing in the US uh, is about 28. Well, it's probably, this figure is out of date already. It changes every minute, but it's about $29 trillion. Suck hard, it's not too bad. Now I'm going to see if we get uh, Jerome Powell talk. Simply flooded the system with money. Skip him as well, actually. Yes, we did. To, uh, That's another way to think about it. The dot plot. In the US, what's happening to monetary policy? It is expected that uh, interest rates will not rise 
uh, through much through 2022, maybe about 15 basis points, and then up to uh, 1% by 2023. This is what the indications are from the FOMC at the moment. They're saying they're going to begin tapering. Not too sure about that. The same rates may rise. Well, maybe they will. Maybe they'll increase much faster than this. We'll see an interesting chart for the UK. But they're talking about the dot plot, and they're also talking about the prospects for tapering. Oh, see what I did there? With I know it's a tape here, but you just get the message anyway. They're talking about maybe tapering this year. We'll see. It's all very unsure. I'm not even sure the FOMC really know. So that's a wrap up of or a roundabout where looking at uh, the world economy, specifically leading economies of China and the US. And now we're going to focus very much on what's happening in the UK. Some heavy charts coming up. So grab your coffee or your tea or whatever you're drinking and uh, sit hard in your chair because we're going to look at some interesting numbers. Uh, which will be reflecting what's happening. So first of all, we had um, in you know earlier this year, the governor of the Bank of England saying that the recovery will be faster than forecast, about 7.25% in 2021 is what they were saying. And the whole day, who was then the chief economist at the bank, he's now moved on to the RSA. Well, he's actually doing this project for the government on, on levelling up, but he'll soon be in the RSA within six months. But he was saying because of low interest rates, high liquidity, the household balance sheets are very strong and there's lots of money for investment that the economy is going to recover like a coil spring. Well, it has recovered like a coil spring with growth up 24 percent year on year in the second quarter. And the economy has been growing at a, an eye popping rate. As they say Q2 is up by 24 uh, percent and obviously it's going to slow. We expected it to slow, but growth in Q3 was still up by 7.5 percent compared to prior year. And when we look at the forecast update, this is our central scenario. We see that growth this year could be about will be about 7.25% in our central scenario, and it'll be 5.5% next year, uh, slowing towards trend rate of 2% over the next two or three years. And when we look at our scenarios, we just see the scenario to the upside. It is, bear with me now, it's almost statistically impossible to get growth around 6.8%. The numbers mean that in the first quarter, growth was down by 4%. In the second quarter, it was up by uh, 24%. In the third quarter, it's up by 8%. Do the arithmetic. It's already growing at 7% plus by the end of Q3. And it would have to go backwards in Q4 for growth to hit the kind of numbers that the IMF and the OECD are talking about. So nobody's really projecting that at the moment. But generally, growth baseline scenario we're going to model with is seven and a quarter. But actually, it could be higher than that. We think it. I think it could be much higher than that this year. And when we look at this sort of growth, first, look at the trend rate. We see have a group. This is using what we call ABMI, the chain volume measure. But we see this trend rate of growth of two two point one percent, enormous setback to the economy, and then the recovery. The recovery will move back towards trend as it was over the next two, three, or four years. And when we look at our alternative measure, call it YBFR, but nevertheless, there we have a trend rate of 2% of the economy, same pattern, big setback, recovering back to trend. And this analysis reveals what we call the output gap, i.e., where is the economy compared to where would it have been at a trend rate? So, and because of this persistent output gap waning towards the end of 2023, but not before, then we can see that this is why fears of inflation are relatively controlled because this real output gap remains in the economy. And this will absorb some of the inflationary pressure that we see. A lot of the inflationary pressure is exported into uh, the balance of trade deficit. So when we look at the forecast for inflation, these are the averages for the year as a whole, that this, this year could be hit to 3.5% uh, in 2022, therefore returning back to, uh, to target of 2% for the next couple of years. And when we look at inflation by quarter, it was 3.5% in Q3. Generally, Q4 is going to be about just over 4%. The uh, IFS think it's going to be 4.1, then 4.5 in Q1. Generally, most people expect it to peak in Q1 and then return back towards 2.5% uh, by the end of next year. But it could be that it peaks in Q4 and begins to fade through. So this is a, it's difficult to make pinpoint forecasts at the moment, but this is the central scenario that actually strong growth will continue, inflationary pressures will peak over the next uh, this quarter or next into Q1 next year, but then 
return towards a slowdown and return to target for a number of reasons which we'll touch on. The big issue is what's going to happen to unemployment, especially when we look at uh, think about what's happening with the, the furlough scheme. And again, this is like the IFS scenario. At the moment, at the end of September, we think there's something like a million many on furlough, there are over a million 1.1 vacancies in the economy, and 1.5 million unemployed. Interesting matrix this. The question is, how many of those coming out of furlough will actually be unable to find work? And the IFS reckon it's about 300,000. It could actually be much less because we've seen this real peak and surge in vacancies. So even so, we'll have an element of what we call frictional unemployment, it's not structural, it's not cyclical, we think it's going to be frictional, it may say, take some time, but generally over the next three to six months, the number of surplus jobs that we identify on furlough will be absorbed into the uh, uh, jobs market over the next three to six months. So inflation, um, unemployment peak around five and a half percent in the first quarter of next year. Now vacancies. We've seen this incredible surge in vacancies up to 1.1 million in the latest uh, count. <clears throat> and again, the IFS reckon that uh, the, the natural rate of vacancies for this stage of growth in the economy is about uh, 600,000. But we're assuming that the number of vacancies <clears throat> will ease through the year, probably ending the year about 750, as again, <clears throat> this dis dislocation in the jobs market is uh, comes back to some semblance of normality. I'm going to talk about earnings now. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to talk about earnings because we've this, seen this incredible surge in earnings. Now, part of the reason for the surge is the comparison with the year-on-year -year figures. And when we look forward, we can take a more relaxed view. We think that in the average earnings, again, they'll slow down in uh, Q3 and Q4 towards 3.5%. Uh, <clears throat> Why do we say that? Because, again, the detailed analysis of the the uh, excuse me yeah the details analysis of the trend rate when we look at the trend rate for earnings actually it's about 3.5% and we can see using the um, uh, ONS data for average earnings whole economy that there has been this drop last year creating this anomaly of the growth year on year but then it, generally it will return to trend it is returning to trend over the medium term which is why we can be so confident <laughs> well, if we can ever be so confident, but this is why it, logically it can follow despite the distortions we have seen and despite the pay bonuses for uh, HTV workers that actually the level of earnings will re re return back to some semblance of uh, normality. We call normality 3.5% growth as we move into uh, 2022. So yeah, earnings did look incredibly high, but actually when we look at the trend rate, it's not so alarming, which is one of the reasons why uh, expectations are for um, this not to feed through in the medium term into the price level. But again, this is the more benign scenario for the economy. Some chunky numbers on the labour market. This is our uh, labour market. This is some of our labour market charts that uh, we produce within the South Economist. And generally, what we've seen is this incredibly high level of vacancies, 1.1 million in September, the highest level in health and social and in retail and accommodation and food. So uh, again, it's the question is, how will these vacancies be met as the uh, particular the furlough scheme unwinds? And we know that there've been something like uh, 1.6 is the latest hard data we have for July, but expectations are that by the end of September, the furlough scheme had dropped to a million. So some obviously will return to work because their employers have been paying their wages through this period. Um, and I think that when we look at this breakdown by sector, we can see that, again, the highest level of numbers on furlough are in accommodation and food and in the retail sector. How does that match up? You may be asking yourselves, how does the furlough comparisons by sector work with the uh, vacancies number? Well, here's how it looks from a chart point of view. It's quite fascinating. So if you see the trend line here, we have this reasonably close correlation between the level of vacancies and the level of furlough within the economy. The outlier up in the top left-hand quadrant is health and social. Well, there's something like four times as many uh, vacancies as there are people on furlough at the moment. So this reflects the looming crisis in the healthcare and social care sector. But generally, 
in most sectors, accommodation and food and retail, professional manufacturing and support, the level of vacancies is met by the level of, um, you know, by the numbers on furlough at the moment. So some furlough uh, will go back into work, some will be absorbed into the vacancy levels. And it could be that the projections of 300,000 that go into the unemployment, which is the IFS number over the next three to six months, it could be that number turns out to be higher than we expect. And there could be some level of natural absorption into the economy as a whole. And what we've seen is, from an employment point of view, that actually um, the numbers have been returning. We saw this drop through 2020, and then people have been returning to the jobs market for whatever reason. So the employment picture, it just looked quite fascinating, really. As I say, we have the same phenomenon, the same phenomenon experienced in the US with this high level of vacancies and uh, still, uh, you know, a, a falling level of unemployment. But this incredible desire to make sure that people will only go back to work if they're with happy with whom they work, uh, happy who, who they work for, and they're happy with paying conditions uh, and lots of questions about, you know, how many hours to be worked. Same phenomenon in the US, same phenomenon in the UK. I know later we'll talk about some, let me touch on this. So yeah, an employment change. So what is happening to, here we're going to touch on what's going to happen to government borrowing and what's happening, going to happen to interest rates and monetary policy. Now, in the latest numbers emerging from the ONS, borrowing last year was an eye-watering 320 billion. That's over 15% of GDP. And this year, we see that last year was 325. Uh, the year before that, it was just 57 billion. Remember those days? This year, it's going to be about 175 billion uh, for the current financial year. Difficult because provisions keep swinging in and keep swinging out of the borrowing numbers. So it could be lower year on year basis at the moment, but generally 170 billion is where the IFS at the moment and the Institute of Fiscal Studies, they're not one to argue with when it comes to details on, on the borrowing numbers. So the forecast borrowing is reckoned to be 175 this year, dropping to around 100 billion or just under 100 billion next year and 80. And so the forward look for borrowing looks, you know, we can get pretty relaxed about this. And the IFS have a more optimistic scenario, which sees the debt levels are limited within a couple of years. But 175 billion still seems a fair bet for this year. And that means it's going to be difficult for the um, for, for the for the bank to begin any sort of tapering anytime soon. And when we look at the forecast for public sector borrowing, it's over you know, over two trillion now, over 100 percent of GDP uh, rising moderately um, in, in the in absolute terms, but falling as a percentage of uh, GDP within the economy overall. Now, we have a cynical look at this because we know that uh, something like 30% uh, plus of that debt is owned by the Bank of England. And the asset owned by the Bank of England is, owned, is, a, is a liability for Treasury, both of whom are owned by the government. So at some stage in the future, it's not inconceivable that consolidation could see a lot of this de debt just melt away as the uh, borrowings are wiped out by some incredible intergroup consolidation along the way. Look at some of the hard numbers. We know there's been two and a half million universal credit, the further numbers we've touched on, the U rate we've touched on, and the um, unemployment rate in millions we've talked about. But when we look at the trade deficit, we don't talk about the trade deficit much anymore. The latest figures for August suggest there was some significant slowdown in export and import activity. We attribute that to problems at the docks at the moment, but generally the the forecasts for trade are not such that there would be a problem for uh, UK government. So when we look at these forecasts for the economy, we can see that the real growth over the next uh, three years could be 15%, which means that nominal growth, like when you adjust for a bit of uh, uh, GDP inflation, the real growth numbers could be over 21%. And this is an incredibly positive scenario, this backdrop, seeing through the shorter term issues of supply chain restraints or commodity prices or whatever, that really this is a very strong positive outlook and framework for investment. We're going to see a big surge in ESG constraints, but um, a big surge in, in electric vehicles, in battery installation and so on. And when we look at the numbers by sector, we see the service sector has a trend rate of 2.3%. We reckon it's going to grow this year by about 7.5%. And when we look at manufacturing, trend rate growth of 1%, then, you know, 
a loss of output of 9% last year with a recovery of volumes around 7.5% this year and maybe 5% in the following year. Okay, big focus at the moment on supply chain shortages for manufacturing and issues with um, gas prices specifically. So we did see, we have seen a slowdown, but um, hopefully that will be relatively short term. We've also seen a situation in construction where despite the problems in construction, again, if you look at the PMI market data, always talking about shortages of, uh, of uh, problems with supply chains and problems with recruitment, but generally the output levels are pretty good. And we know from within uh, Manchester, for example, the Chamber of Commerce Manchester Index, the Greater Manchester Index, is into, still into positive growth. So all the output trend data is positive. They're all talking about problems with recruitment and uh, uh, supply. Productivity, I don't get excited about productivity, but obviously the overall trend rate is about 0.4% in the economy as a whole. And with our scenario, we see that returning towards um, the, the trend rate by the end of 2022 into 23. So when we look at consumption, we know there's been this incredible support to consumption because households have not been able to spend their money. They've been accumulating, they've been paying down some debts and piling it up in the, in, in the under the sofa or in the mattress or wherever it is. But we expect a big bounce back in growth this year of about, um, yeah, seven and a half percent in total for consumer spending. Big surge to restaurants and hotels, 42%. Big surge on clothing, big surge on net tourism, especially on staycations, but now foreign holidays opening up. And a big surge into transport as they get back into the cars. So household spending could be as high as 8% this year, which is, even though there have been problems, there are problems in the manufacturing sector and in the construction sector, this does not mean there's anything to inhibit other than second round price effects on incomes from uh, energy prices, but there's very little to inhibit the shorter term impact on uh, the service sector as a whole. So that's generally our, our forecast update for October. Forget that stuff on implied market. We look at inflation. The question is, is inflation transitory or is it a tipping point? And this is the data from our inflation chart book updated on the 15th. It was due to update uh, next week when the inflation figures come out. But prices are hotting up. And what we've seen is oil prices pushed to $83 a barrel, uh, which is not what we had expected. We expected oil to be trading back down below, um, um, yeah, well, actually below $75 to $70 in the current quarter. Why is it not happening? We'll touch on that again moment but the strong growth in demand is pushing up prices OPEC are for the moment holding back they're not going to overproduce to offset that deficit but we're as many including Goldman Sachs are forecasting dollar price of hundred dollars a barrel Brent crew basis we think it's going to struggle to break through much above eighty dollars part of the reason for our forecast getting so wrong is what's been happening to um, and here's a good chart but if you love charts this is a good chart this looks at the relationship between Brent crude, uh, the blue line, and um, the rig count, the US oil rig count, US oil, biggest oil producer in the world. Normally, we see a very high correlation, especially when you like it by 14 weeks, between prices and uh, US oil rig capacity. So what I and many had expected is as the prices recovered from 2020, we'd have seen that orange line or pick up quite substantially. It's already picked up a lot from the low. It was about 433. Rig, there's a rig count on the latest data, but we'd expect it to be almost, uh, well, up to 900 would be the rig count. And the US oil rigs have been holding back for a number of reasons, including storm damage, including uh, reluctance to get the pumps working again. And it also a pressure, apparently, on the oil producers for investors worried about environmental considerations. So the oil price, we think, many think it's going to peak because OPEC won't want to see that point of uh, overpricing, which leads to too much substitution. But also the oil rigs are coming on stream to support uh, price fall. So that's one reason why we think uh, oil prices will stabilise and begin to fall back. Where next for gas prices? Again, this is incredible spike. But we saw we've seen spikes before we've seen spikes there almost four years ago and when you look at it you know is it a hike or a spike it looks incredibly like a spike and uh, we know that there'll be pressure there is pressure 
to bring uh, Nord Stream 2 online. It's more or less ready to be plugged in. And in any case, we now know that uh, Quasi Kwarteng is um, going to be supported by the Prime Minister with support for, um, for businesses. On certain commodity prices, we've seen copper coming off the top, but we've seen aluminium taking up the charge as uh, it begins to move into really high squeaky uh, territory. But inflation is always and everywhere a transitory phenomena, we say. And even if you do get a hike once, then the passover levels, the pass-through levels mitigate if prices stay at that level. And we're going back to oil. We know that you know, oil was trading at $20 a barrel in April last year. And generally, that impact of higher prices will fade into, even if it stays at current levels, it will fade into Q2 and Q, uh, Q1, Q2 next year. There have been problems in the lumber region, but uh, they've fallen back radically. And the Bloomberg Commodity Index has been, uh, well, again, this is the update, uh, which is still showing incredibly high levels. Gold, one of the bell, bellwethers of um, inflation, that's been relatively muted, trading at 17.95. You know, we live it at 12.50, we don't like it at 17.50. But in inflation is the bellwether is not getting the excitement. The real speculative winner is into Bitcoin, is it trading at uh, $57,000 again at the moment. No doubt we'll touch on Bitcoin. The governor, what sent me to here? It's to you. Again, skipping what he was saying. Came down here. Yeah. And in the afternoon. And you know it's not good when they In talk. the bank at the moment, this is how the hawks and doves line up. Michael Saunders have been calling for an imminent rate rise. Hugh Pill, the new chief economist, he's been suggesting rates will rise. But when we look at the prospects for interest rate rises, the firm red line is where really the markets think they're going to be with no rate rise except into mid-2022, perhaps by about 15 basis points. Bank of America have recently been suggesting rates will rise uh, to um, maybe up to 50 basis points as we move into next year and 75 basis points by the end of next year. That looks good. Awesome. So generally the view is, you know, the, um, the Bank of England won't move ahead of the Fed and the Fed ain't going to move anytime soon. They're all too worried about dislocating their recovery. We know that uh, Rishi Sunak, in fact, they may have to spend a bit more money, uh, despite what they're saying about um, tapering or reduction QE in the UK. And the Rishi Sunak may yet get to fill his trillion pound banknote. So just finally, to wrap up on what's happening in the markets, we've seen bond rates rise in the US to about 160, fading back, it was about 156 this morning, and the UK 10-year uh, rates were 115, 110. Um, it was Bill Gross of PIMCO, who said that well, Jamie Dimon said cash is trash. Jamie Dimon at uh, ex-PIMCO says bonds are garbage, and uh, he's also saying that uh, Bitcoin is worthless. But nevertheless, these rates should be back up at two and a half, three and a half, if not four and a half percent, with an incredible story about the inherent capital loss that would mean for bondholders. And we look at the, you know, we're seeing a breakout in um, UK gilts now, and we're seeing a breakout in 10 year bond yields. But within the, at the South Economist, we now do our Monday morning market up late, where we look at what's happening with uh, 10, a basket of 10 currencies around the world. We reckon US equities are overvalued by about 10% at the moment, with fair value in uh, Europe and you know, some good buying opportunities in China. Um, and currencies, we model currencies and map currencies every Monday with uh, uh, sterling off the top from 138 to having tested 140, it's now back at 136. A lot of sentiment in favour of the dollar at the moment. And then we look at our empires of the cloud fund, that's the big stocks of Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google and so on. Again, an overvaluation at the moment of 10 or 11%. And we also analyse every week our crypto wallet where we've seen this incredible surge in crypto prices. Uh, it's now become the, not so much, it's not a great investment, but it's a wonderful speculative trading opportunity for many. So that's our wrap up. We also get uh, metal prices. So that's our wrap up. What we see is this shock to the economy, this seismic event, which is causing this dislocation bin between supply and demand. And um, yeah, the forecast for the scenario as is that our central forecast is about seven and a quarter percent growth this year, despite all the gloom and doom in the economy. And it could turn out to be much, much better. So that's my wrap up as we, uh, I'm sure there'll be a number of questions raised on, on that. Gary. 
John, thank you so much. Um, really fascinating as ever. Um, lots of questions coming through. So I will um, I'll kick us off, John, with a with a question. Um, so you've you've looked a lot at US, China, um, and the UK. Just just to expand those horizons for a minute, how do you see Europe faring? And maybe then secondly, broader than that, what about the world outside the US and China? Do you see warning signs there, calls for optimism? Well, again, the, the uh, both the OECD and the IMF are forecasting growth and recovery in Europe. So it, it's and you can see that reflected fully enough in that's why it's all about inflation, stronger inflation in, in America at the moment at 5 percent plus. Then second growth in the Western economies is the UK, where we see inflation at about three and a half percent. But inflation in the EU at the moment is still a lower level on that. But we see growth, um, identified growth in, in, in Europe, but it's around two, two and a half percent in the current year. Elsewhere in the world, there have been still some strong numbers coming projected for India. And really, it's a, it's a combination of um, you know where they are in the COVID cycle. Dreadful term to introduce into it, really. But certain economies still struggling with the vaccination program and also their infection programs. And these are reflected in the main in the in the um, OEC for data and OEC CD forecasts. But generally, you know, when you're getting a strong growth in the two largest economies in the world and the European bloc, that's a big pull through for the world as a whole. And that in itself is creating this short term distortion, this seismic dislocation between supply and demand reflected in the chip crisis and also the energy crisis. Yeah, and you, I mean, you mentioned the vaccine there, and again, another question there as well. I mean, with 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 the new variants that we see, and a lot of world struggling to access vaccines, should we be ready for more economic models? Do you think that are kind of linked to a lack of access to the vaccine before before we move into a I don't know, a vaccinated world? Well, I think the IMF have been quite careful to focus on the issue. If you read the I don't recommend anybody reads it, <laughs> but, but if you do look at the detail of it, they're, fo they're focused very much on uh, vaccination, rates of vaccination and possible rates of infection. And we see that sort of, you know, we've seen issues in on supply where uh, there have been dislocation in China, but also uh, problems on loading the containers coming out of uh, Vietnam and Thailand because of this issue. But the IMF dwell at great length on it and uh, they're experts in that space and they're always constantly talking about they do talk a lot about the delta variant and possible other variations but you know we we always now have to be ready for another black swan or a flock of or a herd of whatever the collective known is for black swans that there could be a lot of them coming at a rate we've never expected before but we can always know the mantra has got to be you've got to do your scenario planning and i think that uh, you know i present a good baseline case and you can model off depending on how optimistic or pessimistic you are but the, the imf do focus on it at great length. Uh, thank you. It's um, just one more question, and before I just I'll, I'll hand to Layla for a, a couple of her questions. And as you said at the very start, John, you um you do give us each and every time a, a healthy dose of optimism. I I would guess that many people here feel that we are seeing significant warning signs in the UK at the minute, particularly when you take them together, gas prices, food prices, supply chain disruption, queues at petrol stations, very obvious signs of disruption. In your even in your darker, less optimistic moments, do you, do you not <laughs> see these as early warning signs that maybe we're in trouble? We're off the normal charts. And we need intervention and change in order to stabilise our economic outlook, rather than expecting to ride, I think, as you described, like the dislocation and growth pains um, that we're currently seeing. Oh, well, you know, you want to see, actually, you want access to my black dog forecast. <laughs> <laughs> but they're locked away anyway. But you've got to remember, like I was like, I've been of an age where I can remember the crisis of 74, 75, when inflation hit 25%. And I can remember the energy crisis, which led to a three day week. And I also remember though those high numbers, OK, they led to a spike in interest rates. But those high numbers mitigated very quickly over time that inflation peaked and fell back. And in the three day week, actually, manufacturing produced more in three days than it did in five days. How about that for a surge in productivity? So you have to accept that, you know, as economists, we work on reversion to the mean that sooner or later, 
the the economy gets back to trend rate as a whole. There could be some adjustments which we model off. But human spirit, human initiative and markets tend to prevail that if you do get high prices, that means you get that like the OPEC or where the oil prices remain too high, that could lead to substitution effect. And equally with gas prices. Now gas prices, gas prices may rise because demand has moved ahead of supply, but the cost of extra extraction remains the same. The cost of the product remains the same. The fact that it's it, containers get a call mid-ocean to switch to Shanghai as opposed to uh, Rotterdam uh, is pushing up the prices, but the cost of extraction remains the same. And that's why we can be so positive that these phenomena like you know commodity prices, metal prices may peak, but that just means more mines open up. Oil prices may peak, but the US oil rigs would come on stream and the OPEC will open the taps. In gas prices, Nord Stream 2 will come on stream. They'll come on stream because uh, Europe needs the gas and they shouldn't be dependent on American LNG and foreign policy pressure there. So, yeah, you could say it's optimistic and that's why you have to develop your scenarios and you want to do your black dog forecasts, uh, then you, you can come up with a pretty pe pessimistic scenario. But the important thing is always to not watch the headline, to look at the data. And the data tells us, as with earnings, that they will fall back. And it tells us, as with other commodity prices, and they will fall back. Generally, you know, you know, we know that oil prices are very pervasive in terms of inflation. And we've got something like a ten, if you have a ten percent surge in input prices for manufacturing, the pass-through rate is fifty percent into output prices, and the pass-through rate into uh, goods inflation is about thirty-five uh, percent. So we model all these things at length, and that's why. Yeah. You go back to this reversion to the mean scenario, and you have to model off. Do your scenario planning and model off. There you go. You heard yeah, it here off. again, everyone. Ignore the headlines and look at the data. Um, yeah, and don't watch don't watch news night. Otherwise, you'll <laughs> burst the screen. Absolutely, Layla. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So, John, that was interesting. You've already kind of I had a couple of questions before coming on to the uh, update this morning, which you've answered one of them. But I'll share with everyone what it was and what we're seeing at Robert Half because it does tie in. So last Tuesday at the Conservative Party conference in our hometown of Manchester, uh, Boris said he was not worried about inflation because he felt that supply would meet demand, um, which is absolutely contrary to what we're seeing at Robert Half with salary soaring and ONS data showing a 5% increase this month on uh, monthly pay. My question was going to be about sustainability, but you've answered that in terms of the, with showing the grass with the inflationary inflation settling down and things settling down across next year. So, um, but what I will ask you about that we've we've recently surveyed, we've recently done a, our 2022 salary survey, but based on some of your stats, we may need to update some of it. But I will correlate the two. And I have a question around productivity. So we're absolutely seeing the effects uh, in recruitment at Robert Half. Obviously, we do you know more kind of professional. Um, uh, we we don't do drivers and we, we're not seeing some of these issues, but we're all aware that's happening um but some of the things that we are seeing um will link back to a question i have on productivity so we're seeing things like we're, we're seeing it's a very candidate driven market so for every everything you have said candidates are calling the shots at the moment um you know 40 so in, a, in our recent survey when we asked candidates how likely is it that you'll look for a new job in the next 12 months 66 percent said very likely uh, so that we will see that, uh, I think, continuing, and that's partly disruption. Um, there are a lot of salary increases available in the market at the moment. So there's a tension between retention and attraction, which is, of course, driving salaries up. Um, but one of the things, one of the other big areas that our, our, salary, our, our survey highlighted was this increasing concern on the balance for employers of flexibility versus burnout. Everybody wants homeworking. Employers want people back into the office because there's a bit of an issue around culture now and creating culture. So employers are quite focused on um, balancing culture focus. And that leads to my question about productivity, because, again, this week, ONS productivity stats released show a increase, uh, a 5.2 percent increase in output per work a quarter on quarter. Um, we're still below pre band pre-pandemic levels, but we see this as a as a, as a jump. Uh, and I've, I've just said 46% of our um, employers uh, who are hiring are concerned about this spike in productivity. You've got influx of new hires coming in. So 
what do you think the expectation is? What What's your view on individual and productivity and, and what that will do, what this tension will do into next year? Uh, well, I... I don't get too excited about productivity, really, because I think that, you know, if, if you're in a manufacturing business, then it's significant. You see switches in by capital investment or uh, central management tier elimination. You can de- generate improvements in output per capita or output per head and productivity. In certain sectors, the service sector, it's more difficult in terms of, um, you know, wages on tables or level of in healthcare and uh, social care and even government. It's that level of service which has to be offered. So when you look at the economy overall, you know, that stat I showed was a trend rate of about 0.4% in productivity. And I think what you do get, it's misleading to use, as the ONS do, um, th- these issues of what's happening over the next, last month or the last quarter. Because if you get a surge in output, like 24% in Q2 or 7.5% in Q3, with a fixed uh, labour base, then you're going to see a surge in output per capita when you do the arithmetic. Productivity is simply an output derivative, output divided by labour O over L equals P. It's not an input to, this is controversial, but, it, you know, you're going to see these anomalies. And I think that we have to now see, we have to stand back and let the market uh, settle. Sure. So, you know, on the government policy point of view, this is not the time to cut uh, universal credit. It's not the time to put up NI. It's not the time to be playing about with uh, with um, with uh, corporation tax and other forms of tax, we have to see, we have to let the economy settle after this, a bit like a patient after an enormous shock, it's now in recovery with this seismic uh, disruption. We need to let the patient develop and see how the economy will develop. So it isn't the time for uh, fiscal policy interruption. And as with um, issues of policy and productivity, we have to let the market settle down because, you know, as you say, these incredible pressures about getting people back into work, back into the office, and this shock of work-life balance. We have to see how that's going to unfold over the next, uh, it might take, it's going to take six months, it may take a bit longer to see. But mm-hmm. you know, I think it will. Really, we, we, very we, inter- interesting dynamics in the recruitment market because of that, this tension of uh, burnout versus culture, you know, flexibility in working. That was a big one on, on, the, on the salary survey. I think, you know, expectation is that hybrid and remote working is here to stay that's absolutely the expectation of candidates if it's not on offer they're not going to come and join employees are wanting to uh yeah to to create this balance so i i agree with you john i think it's going to take a year or two to to settle down into some uh more yeah um normality that works for different sectors and different sizes of companies whether it's startup scale up or large corporations yeah for sure great later thank you so much for that um, I'm just going to just cover some of the other questions we've seen coming through. Um, John, uh, the CEO of Matsui said recently that the global shipping market won't return to anything like we're used to until 2023. And we're likely to see, you know, we're going to continue to see the effects of that right up until the end of 2022. Will the impact, will, will this impact goods on the shelves, prices and increased demand and food banks? Are we going to see a hard winter? Is Christmas going to be cancelled? <laughs> well, there's no doubt that, you know, there's incredible disruption with the containers. Well, A, the, the, the ships queuing on the west coast of America to get into port and B, the ships being turned away from UK, Felix, though, because they have to be chopped up before they can brought back to the UK. Uh, so there is a problem because, you know, output fell by 10% in Q2, uh, capacity was cut in Q3, suddenly there's a boom again and the containers are in incredible demand. There's uh, it takes a big lead time, big investment coming forward now in the in new container investment, but it will take time and there's going to be and a lot of containers are in the wrong place and empty containers languishing at the ports. Um, so, yeah, it looks as if it's going to be if you're lucky, it might be a six month unwind. If you're not so lucky, it could be well into you know, the more pessimistic view is the end of 22 into 23. So certainly you're in for a six month haul, which will mean that, you know, we, I think we've got too used to having um too much product available at all times and i think that is because of this seismic event it's going to take time to adjust so yeah we'll see but you know you can't and can't get turkeys because not enough people to look after the turkeys we're going to have to import them from france and poland so you know so yeah it looks like there's a bit of disruption to come for some time okay see hopefully with hgv see if you're mugging get in there like uh, 
octogenarians in care homes are being urged to get back in the cab. <laughs> <laughs> so, and if you if you're training you're not even training you'd have to pass the reversing test so that'd be all right as i say soon soon the the, the hgvs are going to be able to use the hard shoulder to improve the flows of traffic that's the way we're going so yeah so, so i'm sorry liz not a, not quite as a optimistic answer to your question as uh, as we were hoping but um you've heard it here um, okay, thank you ever so much, John. Um, do you, John, do you see, uh, looking at tax rises now, do you, do you see the recent tax rises announcements are going to have a positive or negative impact on our longer term future? Well, tax rises never have a, you know, a positive impact on anything. I, I go back to the point, you know, this is not the time to be playing around with uh, universal credit or with the tax rises because we have to see you know, we have to let the economy revert to the mean to get back to some semblance of normality because there's no pressure really from the markets to reduce the level of borrowing. The Bank of England is there as the lender of last resort to step in and meet the gap. So there's no short term pressure. There's a bit of political play, but we've yet to see how that's going to unfold because the Treasury want to allegedly want to sort of clamp up a bit. But Johnson continues to press the spending uh, pump. So, yeah, it was it's not the time to do it. They've done it. It won't be good for um, for you know, the employment levels because it's the cost of employment, and um, it won't be good for investment in the medium term. So, one would have preferred for this not to take place at the current time. But there, that's politics for you. So that's not economics. It's not driven by economics. It's driven by politics. Do you, do you see then? Our, our future economic strength linked to, and, and particularly in the context of the high energy prices now, do you, do you see our best hope or one of our strongest hopes around renewable technologies? Well, I think that's one of the exciting things, definitely, because, you know, this whole ESG, ESG, ESG agenda means that uh, there's big investment opportunities. So we go back to the focus on transport infrastructure investment programs into transport infra infrastructure and telecommunications as being so critical, then the excitement of battery technology, of electric vehicles, of the installation challenges and the uh, potential for uh, electrical investment, the investment in wind power, in solar power, in alternative energy, including some back but recovery of uh, nuclear capacity. So yeah, I, I think it's a very positive outlook for investment, domestic investment in the UK. The money will come in from abroad to assist the process. The, a lot of money coming will come in from China, if we throw aside our uh, geopolitical concerns there. So the outlook for domestic demand looks uh, extremely positive, I think. And uh, you know, when we look at areas of disruptive innovation, then there's some exciting opportunities with robotics, AI, robot process automation, battery technology, blockchain even. So it looks great. We did a lot on, you know, we, we talked a lot over the last couple of years about digital disruption. That's, that got, got me to Moscow as a guest of Gazprom two years ago. Then last year it was all about digital acceleration, the rate of change. Now we say it's all about digital accommodation, learning to live with life online, with a lot of exciting developments in in um, in uh, digital acceleration and permeation for businesses generally, and also this new world of you know going back to the employment sphere, this new world of the metaverse where you can go with virtual reality and augmented reality in the workplace. Because there's no doubt if you're trying to recruit people and build a business, challenge you onboarding from a distance is incredibly difficult if not impossible and i know people who've, who've moved jobs and never even met their co-workers in the last year or so i'm sure you have too Leila. so it's just a strange world but i think generally going back to your point about investment or your point about prospects it's incredibly exciting and positive as we move forward really because if government commit to a leveling up agenda for whatever that means it does mean that money will be made available to the regions to support growth but John, just very, very quickly, one final comment then. You mentioned before about how some of the ESG priorities are on hold. Do you, do you think while we see these, this disruption, this dislocation, do you think we can, should, will see ESG priorities um, being, being pushed alongside um, the disruption that we see? Do you think that can be done? Do you think it's compatible? Well, I think, yeah, I think it has to be done. I think it's sort of, you know, the I don't generally use... I do snappy headlines for, for as a clickbait, but putting the ESG agenda on hold was, was certainly one of those things. You've got to meet the short term challenge of uh, energy disruption, but also you cannot hold back on the level of forward looking where we go with the, uh, particularly with the, uh, the whole ESG agenda. Okay.
John, thank you ever so much. Um, it's nine o'clock. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we're out of time. And John, another fantastic session. So thank you very much. Um, if, you've liked what you. I've heard, if you like what you've heard today, please feel free to contact John. You can find him on LinkedIn, on his Saturday Economist blog. But also please feel free to contact us here at Protirity and Robert Half. And you'll see in the chat, um, my team have posted the salary survey, which Leila and John were talking to earlier. Um, very sorry if I didn't get to your question directly, um, but there will be a video of our forum post on our website today. So you can once again see all that statistical fueled analysis. Um, please share with your colleagues, friends and LinkedIn contacts. Um, and look, until next time, again, on behalf of all my colleagues here at Petirity and Robert Half, really like to extend our best wishes to you all. Um, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you, everyone.